Good morning, church. Well, that was great. I appreciate that. Amen. We just want to welcome all of those who are visiting with us today or maybe watching uh, via our live stream. You know, today is a special day in the history of the church. Today we celebrate Pentecost, 50 days after the empty tomb was discovered. Empty, Easter Sunday. Jesus was not found there then, but we know that he has sent the Holy Spirit who is with us today. Amen? Amen. We celebrate that. In Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, we read, So when they, the disciples, had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons. So when we get anxious, we need to remember those words. Amen? It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. The word of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is our helper, and he is with us this morning. If you're visiting with us or watching online, you have an opportunity to connect with us by completing one of our connect cards, which I've got right here. You can get this from the ushers up front. You can get these at our uh, greeting tables, but we want you to be able to sign those, fill them out, and let us know that you're here. We're thankful to have you here. If you're watching online, you can go ahead and text with the number that's up there on the screen and let us know that you're watching as well. Two weeks ago, excuse me, we are now two weeks away from uh, summer officially beginning, so we want you to be aware that our summer activities are just about ready to go. Each Wednesday at noon during the June and July months, our WMU Here to Serve program is ministering to families here in the Palmetto Preserve Apartments and in the area. They're serving lunch and building relationships with the children, the parents, the adults who reside there. We also have our Breaking Bread with Jesus outreach Saturday the 11th and 25th at 9 a.m. at our food pantry location. These are wonderful opportunities for us to be able to help reach our Palmetto community with the gospel as we interact with them, as we connect, grow, and serve. June 12th is our Vacation Bible School. It will launch at 545, so be sure parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, children, to be here before 545 so we can get you in, registered, and get started on time. And it'll be ending at 8 o'clock each evening, the 12th through the 15th. See Michelle Gaddy or go to our website and you can register there, not just for the children to sign up to attend, but again, for us to be able to come and help to serve them. Today, following our 11 a.m. Bible study hour, and again, following the second worship service, our youth will be hosting a special lunch fundraiser. So be ready to give a donation to help support our youth as they head out next week for their beach camp retreat. Let's take a few moments now to greet one another in the name of the Lord.
Well, as we begin this worship hour this morning, if you would remain standing as we come together and sing, I know whom I have believed in, and blessed assurance. I know not why God's wondrous grace to
Don't you hate it when your glasses get fogged up and you can't read through them? <laughs> you ever had that happen to you? This is not a commercial break. <clears throat> you know, as we continue our time of worship here this morning, again, we're just so thankful that each of you are here. And we thank you for your support of what we do here at Palmetto. And we also hope that the song that we just sang, that that is your story, that you know Christ as your personal Savior. Amen? Amen. So as we enter into this time of worship through offering and prayer, our ushers will be available here in the aisles for you to be able to give of your tithe and your offering. You may also choose to give online via the info that will be shown up on the screen. Also on the screen as we pray, you're going to see names of people who we pray for each day here at PBC. We pray for them throughout the week. We gather together on Wednesday nights at 5 o'clock to have a special time of prayer. And we want to invite each and every one of you to come and be a part of that each Wednesday as we gather to pray for these and many others. Let's go ahead and go to the Father in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your promise to send the Holy Spirit as you prepare to fulfill your plan for our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, the Holy Spirit, for being with us here this morning as we come to you in this time of worship and prayer. You know our needs. You know our hearts. We ask that you meet us where we are and that you help us to be able to cling to you each day. May we place our trust in none other. Father, we ask that you continue to affirm and lead the next pastor and his family. We ask that you continue to give clear guidance to our search committee as they are searching for your man to come and to lead PBC. We pray for all of those who serve within our church. Help each of us to always recognize you as the source in our lives as we serve each other here and as we go out into the community and the communities around in your name. Father, we pray that you help our Southern Baptist Convention, the leaders and the churches, to follow you and to be accountable to your spirit and those in authority over them, especially to you. Father, we pray for Brother Chris Reynolds as he shares his heart with us through the teaching of your word. Allow us to receive from your word and then to apply what you give us as we live our lives in this world that so desperately needs you. Father, we ask that you bless our tithe, our offering, our time of worship. Help us to be able to focus on you, not our own troubles, not our own struggles, not our own trials, but help us to be able to lay those down at the foot of the cross and to trust in you to give us everything that we need to make it through each day and through this time of worship. Father, we thank you, we praise you, and as always, we ask that you help us to be a church filled by you, the Holy Spirit, as we strive to be people who help others to follow you as we connect, as we grow, as we serve, as your church, as your people. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ and all of God's people say together, amen. amen. <laughs>
as we continue in our worship, if you would stand together as we sing Rock of Ages. Oh 
There we go. Sorry, I turned it off instead of turning it on. I apologize. Um, I'm Chris Reynolds. It's been a little over a year since I was here with you last, and it's certainly good to be with you again today. Um, over the last year, through Dr. Rob and others, I have heard how God has done many good things in your midst, and I'm excited for you as you are, I'm sure, nearing the call of your next pastor. So congratulations and well done. And this morning we have the opportunity to be together to open our Bibles and uh, to look at God's Word. So go ahead and turn to the book of 2 Timothy. Whether you turn physically in your Bible or look it up on your phone does not matter. Um, I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version. People ask me why. Do I use the New King James Version? And it's, I use it because I'm in a lot of different churches, and regardless of the translation that a church uses, this one will hit just about in the middle where everybody can follow along. So when I do read, I'll be in the New King James Version. And so go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Just hold your place there because I want to do some introductory thoughts that will actually get us to the passage here in just a moment. One of the things that we can find in Scripture is that God always leads us to community. God leads us into relationship with other people. Um, often in Scripture, we find where there is someone who has built a relationship with another person, and in building that relationship, they begin to invest in them, and investing in them both of them seem to grow in their faith. So, for example, if we just went through Scripture, we would find Moses and Aaron. So if you remember Moses and Aaron, Moses is at the burning bush. God says, I want you to go back and get the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses looks at God and says, I can't, I can't, I can't, and I won't ultimately. And God says, well, I tell you what, um, I'm going to send your brother Aaron. And you will be the, um, God to him, and he will be your voice to the people. So there's an example of a relationship where two people come together, and in their relationship, they accomplish the will and the purpose of God. David and Jonathan, you remember David was the heir um, king to be, but Jonathan was the heir apparent. Jonathan was the one who had every right to be the next king of Israel. But Jonathan, in his sensitivity to the Lord and in his devotion to David, Jonathan looked and said, I want the Lord's will more than I want my right or my way. And he became a sacrificial. He sacrificed his position and ultimately put his life on the line so that God's will could be done. So we've got Moses and Aaron. We've got David and Jonathan. David, again, had another friend. David had a friend named Nathan. Nathan was a prophet, and David, by this time in his life, had already been king, and he had already um, been in the season of his life where he stepped away from the Lord, turned his back really on God's purpose and will for his life. You remember he had the, the adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, and ultimately to cover that, he had, had Uriah killed. Uriah was Bathsheba's husband. And Nathan was the one that went to David and told him a, a story about a man who had a lot of sheep and a man who had one sheep. And he pointed out to David that his sin was against God. And you know, out of that conversation, Psalm 51 was written, God against you only and against you and you only have I sinned. A great sim, sim, uh, psalm of confession. So, Moses and Aaron, Aaron is strengthening Moses. David and Jonathan, Jonathan is sacrificing what he should be and could be so that God's will is done. Nathan is the confronter. Nathan comes to him and says, hey, I, this isn't going to be popular and you're the king and you could have me killed if you want to, but I feel like that I owe this to you to come beside you, to encourage you to come back to the place where you were with God. But, but you could keep on going. You've got Ruth and Naomi, remember? Um, 
Naomi is the mother-in-law. Ruth is the, is the daughter-in-law. Um, Ruth's husband dies, and Naomi says, I'm going back to be with my Hebrew people. And, and Ruth says, I'm going to go with you. And you remember those famous words now. We use them in weddings and other places. Where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. That's a relationship. That's two people agreeing to do life together for the purpose of strengthening one another. We don't always understand when we walk beside someone how God is going to use it. But when two people come together and say, for God's glory, we're going to live, he works through them. You could go on down. And even another example, just a little bit different, is Esther and Mordecai. Esther is the, is the young lady. Um, the people of Israel are in danger. The king has got people talking into his ear, and he's trying to, this gentleman is trying to get the children of Israel to be punished, wiped out. And Esther realizes God's using her. She goes to Mordecai and says, Mordecai, what do I do? And her wise cousin gives her counsel, and, and she says, If I perish, I perish. But yet I want God's will done. You see, every one of us need people in our lives. Every one of us need to be a person that someone else can count on. Every one of us needs to be an encourager. And every one of us needs to be encouraged. That's the journey of faith. That's what God is calling us to. He's not calling us to be little islands that sit in chairs. He's calling us to be a body that works together. Another example that I'd like to give you, and this is where I'm going to camp out this morning, is the example of Paul and Timothy. All of those relationships in Scripture that I just told you about have taught me something and have spoken to me in some way and, and encouraged me to good works. But this relationship with Paul and Timothy, I think, went beyond that. And I want to just show you some things about their relationship. And then um, hopefully from that we can draw some truths out that will help us to understand even more what God is calling us to do as Palmetto Baptist Church, but even more importantly, the body of Christ. Um, if I think about Paul and Timothy's relationship, the first phase of that relationship, I would tell you, is the stage of parenthood. Now, I don't mean parenthood as in my wife and I have a daughter and a son, but I'm thinking in a spiritual sense here. It's the spiritual sense of here's Paul who is mature in faith, here's Timothy who's wanting to grow in his faith, and Paul looks and says, I want to invest in you, I want to be a spiritual father to you in my life it's a gentleman named Glenn Shepherd Glenn Shepherd is a good bit older than I am Glenn Shepherd and I do not see each other often but every time Glenn Shepherd Shepherd and I are together the Lord usually has an important word that he wants me to hear I remember when my wife and I well let me back way up I remember when I was thought I was born again and I was not the Lord used Glenn Shepherd to show me that I needed to accept Christ as my Savior. I remember when my wife and I were wrestling with ministry and I gave God about 10,000 reasons why I didn't need to go into ministry and Glenn Shepherd literally grabbed me by the back of my neck and said, Lord, make him miserable until he says yes. God answered his prayer. I tried college for nine years. <laughs> <laughs> um, finally graduated, praise the Lord. Um, I tried a lot of other things, but literally God made me miserable until that time. So Paul and Timothy, I would say that the first part of that relationship is a relationship that's kind of like a spiritual father. You say, well, could you back that up with Scripture? I absolutely can. In um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Timothy, my son... So there's a relationship of parenthood. I want to ask you this morning, and, and I'm using Paul and Timothy in, the, in this because it's my relationship, but do you have a Timothy in your life? As a mature believer, do you have a Timothy in your life that you are investing in? 
Do you have someone that you are praying for, someone that you're encouraging, someone that you're walking beside? And, and ladies, do you have a Timothy Ed? And I don't mean that in any way disrespectful, but it's not just male relationships here. I'm talking about are there people that you're pouring your life into? Parenthood. But you see, if I go to the next phase of that relationship, I would say that after he instructed him on what it meant to be a believer, then he began to show Timothy how to live that Christian life. In fact, in that same passage that we're going to unpack in a moment, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10, this is what he says, but you have carefully followed, you see that pace, you have carefully followed me, you have followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me. In my job, one of the saddest things that I see, my job, I work for the Georgia Baptist Mission Board, and I support pastors and their families. One of the saddest things I see is that, that people have a spiritual parent in their life but they do not have a pace setter in their life. They don't have that person that can walk with them through life and says, hey, you need pace, you need rest, you need diet, you need community, you need friendships. You need somebody that you can call and rejoice with. You need somebody that you can call and cry with. You see, Paul made a commitment to Timothy. Paul said, Timothy, I'm going to walk with you as a spiritual father. But Paul, Timothy, I'm going to also walk with you on how to live life. I see young person after young person that they're floundering and they're coming to the church and they're asking questions. How do I be a husband? How do I be a father? How do I confess sin? How do I honor God with my mind, my finances, my relationships? How do I honor God in what I look at and what I say? And the church has gotten busy. We've gotten so busy doing church that we have forgotten to slow down and be the church in the life of those. And the scripture says, hey, y'all with gray hair, what? Go back here and love on those that are younger. Teach them. You see, I, I believe everybody in this room can point to somebody, whether it was a spiritual relationship or not, can point to somebody in your life that taught you something. I'm grateful that I had a father that taught me how to fish. You say, is that a big deal? Well, yes, it is, because we learned a lot of life while we were fishing. At my church, we would have fishing tournaments. We had a pond on the property, and we invited the dads to come teach their sons how to fish. We recognized something on year one is that we needed to have a second fishing tournament for the dads to teach them how to fish so that they could teach their sons how to fish. Church, we need to take the time to be a spiritual parent. Church, we need to take the time to learn how to be a pace setter. And you know, I have reached the age where I can say that's not how we do it. That's not how we've done it. But I'm so grateful that there were people in my life who stepped aside what was, from what was comfortable for them to walk beside me and invest. Paul was a spiritual parent to Timothy. Paul was a pace setter for Timothy. Paul was a partner for Timothy. You see, when you take the time to be a spiritual parent and you take the time to be a pace setter, then you get the opportunity to be a partner with them. In fact, in Romans 16, 21, he says, Timothy, my partner in ministry. I mean, he had called him a son. He had been a pace setter. And now he says, walk beside me. Yesterday, I had uh, dinner with my son. My son is 26. My son has graduated from the University of Georgia. My son is a CPA in Midtown Atlanta. And he asked a question, and I caught myself going back to being the parent. And he said, oh, no, Dad, Dad I didn't tell you that for you to tell me what to do. He didn't want a parent. He wanted a partner. He wanted a friend. 
And that same thing is true in ministry. We need to invest, and then we need to raise up and let the next generation learn how to lead because if we don't let them learn how to lead guess what when we're gone they don't know how to give they don't know how to serve they don't know how to organize and so Paul and Timothy are an example for us so now let's get to our passage because in 2 Timothy first and 2 Timothy it's it's one of three letters that Paul wrote while he was in prison it's one of 13 that he wrote in the New Testament but this one is unique because while Paul is in prison he is knows he's he knows he's not going to get out he knows that he's going to be executed and so when he's writing these words Paul the parent, Paul the pace setter, Paul the partner is, is putting that one last investment, if you will. It's like the parent that's going to send the child off to camp, right? You remind them, bathe, brush your teeth, change your underwear. You know what I'm talking about. Those last minute instructions say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. Don't you do anything that'll embarrass me. Well, that's kind of where Paul is now. He's writing these last words. And, and I think it's interesting to me that in writing these last words, he doesn't give them the lessons because he's giving them why he needs to stay close to the Scripture. So let's just read it for just, just a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. He says, oh, they'll have a form of godliness, but deny its power. And then he says something really important. He says, but from such people turn away. You see, Paul, again, remember where he is. He's in prison. He knows he's going to be executed. He knows that he needs to be giving these final instructions to his partner who is going to become the one who takes over for him. And he says, look, this is what I've taught you, and this is why I've taught you this, and this is why I always told you to stay close to God, stay close to God through the Word. He says, in the last days, this is what people are going to become. He says, Paul, I want, Timothy, I want you to stay close to the Word because the day will be dangerous. He says, the day is dangerous. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you've been watching the news, but I'm going to say we're in a dangerous day. Would you agree with me? I mean, everywhere I turn, it's a, it's a this and it's a that and it's something else and it's, and it's just cruelty and it's people are just mean. Man, we've got to be in the Word because if I'm not in the Word, I'm not going to know how to navigate. What does it say? The Scripture says your Word is what? A lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. In all your ways, acknowledge Him in what? He will make your path straight, right? You see, I've got to be in the Word. I need to be in the Word. Timothy, you need to be in the Word because you're going to be coming up on a time where it's dangerous. It's dangerous just to live, but let me tell you, it's going to become dangerous to be a follower of Christ. Paul says, the day is dangerous. Stay in the Word, but keep on going down. He says, I don't want you just to be in the Word because the day is dangerous. But he actually gives him a, a very practical reason. Drop down with me to verse 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you, okay, this is what's going to happen. In this dangerous day, evil men will become imposters. In this dangerous day, they're going to be deceived. They're going to think that what they're saying may be right. He says, but not only are they going to be deceived, but they're going to become so eloquent that they will be deceiving others. 
And this is an old, old illustration, but it's very relevant to this point. Bank tellers are taught to recognize counterfeit by not studying all of the ways that it could be counterfeit, but being so familiar with the real thing that when they see the wrong thing, they know it right away. So instead of learning a thousand things, they just need to learn one thing. This morning, we need to learn the Word of God so that when what we hear is not consistent, we recognize it is counterfeit, not because we saw the counterfeit, but because we were, saw the real thing. He says, look, I want you to do. But then he says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you learned them. Oh, we need to be in the Word because the day is dangerous. But there's a practical reason also because of the devotion of the saints. Did you see what he said? Know what you learned, and he said what? Know where you learned it from. Now, we know Paul told Timothy that he had learned from his mother and his grandmother, right? How the doctrines of Scripture, we know that Paul had learned from Timothy, Timothy had learned from Paul the doctrines of Scripture, he says, I want you to stay true because of those that have gone before you. Hebrews 12, 1 calls it a cloud of witnesses. Those that have sacrificed, those who have gone on, those who have been martyred, those who have been persecuted, those who have been shunned, those who have been isolated. Timothy, keep on in the word because of people that have gone before you. You say, well, I never had anybody that taught me. Well, can I tell you to be a generation changer, a life changer? Can I tell you to be a legacy builder? My father did not have anyone that taught him how to be a man, a spiritual man, a man of God. My dad, at an urging that he did not even understand, moved our family from one location to another location and got under the discipleship of someone else and now, his family's legacy has changed. We're not alcoholics. We're not abusers. We're not people who abandon children. We're people who understand the word, who seek the word. Before he got Alzheimer's, he gave a testimony to me. He said, the best thing I ever did was the one thing I didn't want to do, and that was move to somewhere else. Because you know the Lord, and your sister knows the Lord, and my grandchildren know the Lord. You see, if it's not what you enjoyed, be sure it's what you give someone else. We need to be in the Word because the day is dangerous. We need to be in the word for those that have gone before us who sacrificed everything so that we today could be in this room studying this word. But keep on reading with me because he doesn't just stop there. He says, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. I'm in verse 15. Which are able to make you wise for salvation. He says, Timothy, you got to be in this word because through this word, through this word, you recognize that you were a sinner. You recognize that sin separated you from God. Through this word, you recognize there was a Savior and his name is Jesus. And through this word, you recognize that Jesus died on the cross and went into the tomb and rose again on the third day to defeat sin, to defeat hell, and to offer you not just relationship with God. He said, but he did it to offer you fellowship with God. He says, you need to be in the Word because the day is dangerous. He said, you need to be in the, the Word because of the devotion of the saints who went before you. He says, you need to be in the Word because of the dynamic of Scripture. It is what makes you wise to the fact that you need salvation. But he doesn't just stop at salvation. He says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable... For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God, the, the woman of God, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
Timothy, you need to be in the Word because it makes you wise for salvation. Timothy, you need to be in the Word because it sanctifies you. It sets you apart. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I want to be, but praise God, I'm not what I used to be, right? Why? Because the Word, it corrects. It instructs in righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, you are on the edge of, of the next piece of your legacy. You're on the edge of calling a pastor who's going to lead you and to lead those that you're going to reach. And we need to be a people of the word because we live in dangerous times. We need to be a people of the word because of those who went before us. We need to be a people of the word because it is what God chose to give us Amen. to correct us, to instruct us so that we could be complete and thoroughly equipped for the good work. And you say, well, what is the good work? Well, I, th I think you could go back to Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them all that I've commanded you, he said. We gather to be encouraged to go and to work. To work at relationships, investing in the lives of people. So that they can come to know that Jesus is the Savior. It's really a cycle. I'm born again. I grow in faith. I give away my faith. That person then goes and shares the gospel and they teach somebody to grow and, and it just keeps on going on and on. And, and those are reasons that we need to be a people of the word. But, but here's the wild card. Here's the thing that when you lay it on the table, it trumps everything else. Look at it. In chapter 4, verse 1, I charge you. I don't know that there's a stronger word of command in Scripture than I charge. It's like when your mama used your full name. She got your attention, right? He says, I charge you therefore. What's the therefore? The therefore is the day is dangerous. The therefore is the devotion of the saints. The, the, the therefore is dynamic of scripture he says I charge you therefore before God in the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing at his kingdom preach the word I need to be in the word so that I know the word so that I can follow the charge of God to preach the word and you say well I'm not a preacher no you see I preach one hour a week I live how many other hours of the week? The sermons that we preach that get heard most often are not the ones in front of a few. It's the ones that we live out in front of people every hour, every day, at work, when times are good and when times are bad. Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, preach the word. Live it out. You're the only Bible some people will ever read. You're the only Jesus that some people will ever see. And Paul has spent his life giving to Timothy. He's at the end of his life and he's saying, Timothy, get in the word, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. He says, you got to know this word because verse, chapter 4, verse 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. You see... Paul tells Timothy that the sensual, that thing which is emotionally drawing, that thing that, that is my temptation, and, and you see, it won't be the same for each of us 
Because each of us are individuals, and as individuals, there are things that, that are temptation for you that might not be a temptation for me. So he's not naming something. He just says that thing that could draw you away from God if you're not careful. He says the, de the deceptive of the sensual. Be careful that you know the word so that when you deviate from the word, that you will recognize it and you can be rebuked and instructed to turn back. But you see, keep on going. We can know the truth. We can repeat the truth. But ultimately it comes down to a decision to follow the truth. Look at it. But you, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. He says, Timothy, I've given you the reasons to be in the Word. Timothy, you've been instructed since childhood. He says, but what I want you to do today is decide. Be watchful in all things. The scripture says, choose today who you will serve. I believe that happens at a moment of salvation, but I also believe it happens every single day of my life. God, today, I'm going to choose you. Oh, God, I know that there's things that, that are going to draw me away, but God, I'm going to choose you. And Lord, when I, when I turn away from those things, when I've been deceived, and when I turn to those things and I, I, I have been deceived, Lord, I want to confess it quickly. Cleanse me from unrighteousness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for an opportunity to be in the Word. Father, I pray that as we are in the Word, that we will choose you. That we will follow you. That we will turn to you. That we will be watchful. That we will be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in this room or online this morning if you've not made a decision to follow Christ as Savior online would you simply make a comment I want to know more in the room would you where you are or come forward from where you are say I want to follow Jesus but can we be a people today that agree Lord, we want to be a people of the Word. We want to live out the Word. We want to show others how to follow the Word. Lord, we thank you for this time. And as we stand in response, Lord, as you speak, give us the wisdom and the knowledge on how to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.
As we close out the service this morning, um, one of the things that uh, I did not bring up during our prayer time was uh, Don and Barbara Crisp. You all know, uh, many of you know, that uh, they lost their daughter, Teresa, this week. Um, we're hoping to have a memorial service, a celebration of life service here uh, toward the end of the month. We're, we're thinking Saturday, uh, June the 25th at 2 o'clock. We've talked with them, and we'll see if that time works out for them. Uh, they're going to have another service down home um, where uh, she and her husband are at, uh, we're at living, and so uh, that'll be on Sunday. But for our church family, for those of you who knew her, um, we want to be able to have a time to remember her as well and, and uh, be with Don and Barbara during this time. So if you haven't called them, if you haven't seen them, um, please do so and love on them. Uh, we always love our church family. Amen? Speaking of loving our church family, Sandra, man, this is your final Sunday with us. And we love you and we appreciate you and we're going to miss you and we thank you. And I can't see you because you're behind the piano. <laughs> But we, uh, we're just so thankful, and uh, it's going to be hard to replace her. In fact, I would say next to impossible, because nobody plays the piano like her. Amen? We're all gifted individually. So as we get ready to leave from here in this time of worship, let's remember to continue our worship throughout the day so that our worship will overflow from Monday uh, into Monday and then Monday into Tuesday. So when we come back again next week, it's not that we're going to be starting to worship all over again, but we're continuing our time of worship each and every day. Let's go ahead and close out our time now with a, a final song. Sing the doxology. Praise God from the